I'm Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, and this is the home of our originally created series, My Story. This is episode number two, uh, episode nine, series number two, should I say, and uh, Ace Podcast Nation, of course, you're home to many other great shows and series featuring top guests, expert analysts, and more. My Story, like all our other shows and series, are available in video format at youtube.com slash acepodcastnation. Please do give us a subscribe, click that bell for notifications. Uh, and then you get a little text every time we go live or we upload new shows or content. They always go to YouTube first, but uh, if you prefer your podcasts in audio form, you can get them at every single podcast platform. Just uh, They're all under the Ace Podcast Nation banner uh, across the across the interweb, as it were. Um, but the links to everything's in the description below. Uh, the My Story series is unique as we take our guests through their life and uh, their career from their upbringing all the way up to present day as they share some stories and anecdotes. Series 1 featured actors, footballers, broadcasters, authors and more. And Series 2 is no different. The tagline is simple. Real conversations with real people. And my guest today, I'm delighted to have back on the channel. But I'm very excited to hear uh, his story today. Is that the lead singer of British band Shed7, Mr Rick Witter. Welcome back Rick, how are you mate? Hello, sir. Yes, I'm good, thank you. And I'm also a real person, so I fit in Indeed. very well. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because, like, a lot of the feedback I get with regards to podcasts, and like, obviously, the podcasts which I do, I do a lot of different ones. But the thing which people do seem to like is that it's quite, you know, it's just relaxed and it's a conversation rather than a like a formal interview and a question answer, question answer. Because I think people feel when you do that, they sometimes get the same answers, which people, especially if you've got, for instance, a, a footballer who's media trained or something like that, and they speak to you know hundreds of broadcasters throughout a year, and they get asked the same questions, they get the same answers every time. Whereas if you're having a conversation with someone, you kind of veer off into different subjects and you could kind of go where you go. And uh, I like that, I do like that. And as I was just saying to you before we started, the thing I really enjoy about this particular series is it doesn't matter what you do, what industry you're in, what career you have, whether you're super successful or you're just starting out, everybody's got a story and everyone everyone's story is different and they've all got little different inspirations and, and anecdotes along the way. And I, I'm sure very, you are no very, different. Yeah, that is very true. And you are right, really, certainly with a profession like football, yeah, they are media trained and they don't give a lot away. You know, they, they, you know, they've got to stick by the rule book. Um, but yeah, you're right. Podcasts, you know, even normal interviews. I think the way forward is is doing it like this over Zoom. You know, people like to connect a little bit more rather than do phone interviews. I think now I don't think you'll I don't think I'll ever do any phoners, so to speak, anymore. They'll always be via Zoom because you get that connection a little bit better. 
Um, and as you rightly say, yeah, the conversation can veer off. Indeed, yeah, I, and that's one of my favourite things actually is when you'd be, we might be, I might have a list of subjects that I want to cover with my guest, and they'll start talking and they'll mention one, you know, one little thing, and then suddenly you're on a completely different subject. That is one of my favourite things. And do you know what? You mentioned phone interviews. I've only ever done one phone interview since I started the channel, and that was with you. So there we go. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Maybe I was where one of your last ever phone interviews could be. Could be, uh, could be <laughs> well, I've done, done enough of them over my time. Oh, I bet. Um, so what I like to do with uh, this, uh, Rick, is basically I just take the guests right back to the start and um, kind of tell us a bit about where you grew up and your sort of your upbringing, where it all began for Rick Witter. Uh, well, I was born in Stockport, Greater Manchester, uh, in the early 70s. Um, don't really recall much about early life. My memory is shot. Uh, it's always frustrating, especially when I speak to family members and they're, they're reminiscing about things. And I have like, no recollection of it, apart from accidents and things like that. Um, I, rem I don't really remember the co first couple of houses I lived in in Stockport, but then we had to move to Torquay because of my dad's job. Um, so we spent two or three years living in Torquay when I was maybe five, six, seven, eight. And at that point in my life, all I wanted to be was a stuntman. <laughs> uh, probably through programs like The Fall Guy. Uh, but I had set the, the, what, one of the, uh, the main memories of living in Torquay was all the accidents I had around about that time, like falling out of a tree and ripping half my ear off, getting my head stuck in a turnstile, turnstile on the Torquay pier, uh, breaking my arm by disregarding my dad and breaking the rules and trying to run away and falling down some steps, uh, falling into a neighbour's swimming pool and luckily someone saw it and dragged me out because I couldn't swim. So loads of different things like that happened, happened in a short period of time in my life at that time. So you were definitely taking the the, uh, the route to stuntman seriously by the sounds of it, even though you were young, you were uh, you were doing your best to get that started by the sounds of it. Yeah, um, all, but all very accidentally though. Yeah, but um, it's what every parent wants to hear, isn't it? When uh, as a parent now, I, I, if my 16 year old said, oh yeah, I want to be a stuntman, I think that would be one of the more worrying uh, jobs I think I could uh, imagine him going for, I think. But um, how did you get your head stuck in a turnstile? Probably by just mucking about. I think, if I remember rightly, we'd gone on a family walk because uh, we lived quite near the near the, um, the pier in Torquay. Um, and at that time, you probably had to put 10p into the turnstile to make it revolve so that you could get through and and rather than just wait and push the turnstile I think I decided to put my head in it uh, and I think my mum said to me once that if someone was behind you who hadn't seen that and turned it your head would have come off so jeez <laughs> that is uh, that's brutal isn't it like, yeah. a couple of those things though, that you said there which those accidents they could have been uh, you know they could have had a very uh, much worse ending and could have been uh, you know, a very different story, obviously, the one with the swimming pool and stuff as well. Yeah, very lucky, really, at that age. But I think you, you at that age, you're indestructible, aren't you? So it, yeah, didn't, it, it didn't, quick. didn't slow me down. And from there, we moved to Whitley Bay up in the northeast um, for a couple of years, all of this because of my dad's job. Um, and don't really have too many lasting memories of that either. Uh apart from the school systems, was slightly different. It was like three different school levels. Um, and I guess my lasting memory of Whitley Bay is finding a, a dirty magazine in a hedge while I was playing football with a friend. Uh, and I had to go and get the ball out of the hedge and discovered a dirty magazine, which was... And I've, I, always, I've always wondered how, though, because it's not just... Uh, it's not specific to one part of the UK... The majority of people from, I'd say, probably like mid thirties and upwards in the UK, like particularly boys who were playing football at the park and stuff, will say how they used to find a carrier bag full of dirty magazines. Don't know how they got there. Don't know, but it's it's like a UK wide thing because I live in Cardiff, nowhere near Whitley Bay, but yeah, I, I had exactly the same thing. 
with, <laughs> by, just randomly in hedges and stuff. It's yeah, it makes you puzzling, know what get up to in these hedges, doesn't it? Really? Oh god, yeah. But this was obviously pre-internet, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's just a weird one, isn't it? Like and like obviously. You know, I've spoken to people from all over the country, and where the few times you'd be surprised it has come up before, and a few the few times it has come up, whoever I've been speaking to, everyone has kind of they've all experienced it. So it's it's a weird one. It's, uh, it was obviously a yes. UK wide problem in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, which has <laughs> been wiped out by the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. My only other, my only other memory of Whitby Bay really is uh, watching Jaws for the first time, and we watched it at. Uh, a family who lived over the road from our house. Okay. Uh, we watched it at their house, and uh, at that age, I was probably about nine, and uh, got quite scared by the film Jaws as a nine-year-old, and I just remember having to walk from their house to our house, which was over a road, mm. and being quite scared that Jaws was going to jump out and get me, which which is fuzzy logic in a way, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah you're not going to get attacked by it. A shark on the way home, I suppose. But then it's like it's one of those things. I th I think correct me, I think Jaws is a fifteen, and like everyone remembers the first fifteen they watched. This was this kind of weird thing, and I, I had this conversation again with a, a friend of mine the other day, or a couple of friends, and they were all sort of saying like they said Jaws and Terminator, and I was sat in the corner and it was really quiet, and they were sort of like, oh, what well, you're a bit quiet there. You've normally got plenty to say. What uh, what was the first fifteen you watched? And the first fifteen I watched was uh, Dirty Dancing, the original. Uh, I'm ashamed to say. So uh, yeah, I wasn't. That one. wasn't uh, it's better. It's better than the remake. That's all I'll say. It's not. It's still not good. But right. But yeah. So with the Jaws thing, I think it wasn't actually the shark. It was the music. That, you know, music in films can the atmosphere, do absolute it? wonders to the film. Yeah, and that can generate so much different emotion levels. But yeah, I guess. I guess. Whitley Bay just reminds me of sharks and porn. <laughs> you like it? I mean, you know, there's there's worse things, I suppose, that you could be reminded of from uh, different places around the around the UK. But which would make a great band name as well, wouldn't it? Shark sharks porn. and porn. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Um, in terms of like your childhood, like and going into your teens and stuff. Was uh, was there ever kind of anything else that you wanted to do career-wise other than music? Was there other options? Uh, no, to put it bluntly. From a very early age, I grew up with a family who there was always music on constantly. My dad, before I was born, was in a band in Manchester, a three-piece band. They used to go around playing in the working men's clubs and the bars. He was a drummer. Uh, he gave that up when my brother came along because at that time it was you, you couldn't really do both things, so he, he had to give it up. But he instilled on us a, a deep love of music. Um, I remember so many car journeys where music was at the forefront. And then when we got a bit older and became teenagers, my, my brother, my, myself and my sister, we'd go on long car journeys and we'd all be sat in the back with our own Walkmans on listening to different types of music. It must have been hell for my mother and father because all they could probably hear was three different types yeah. of... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, yeah, it, it was always there. I mean, I, I, the first time I really thought I want to be a pop star, so to speak, was probably when I was about nine or ten and I would be singing into my bedroom mirror with a hairbrush pretending I was on top of the pops. Excellent. What were you singing? Uh, well, at that time, it could have been any old sharp music because I probably just listened to the radio. Um, yeah. But when I we I moved to York when I was eleven, um, just in time to start big school proper, which is when I first met Paul Banks because he was in my year at school, and Tom Gladwin, the bass player, was in my year at school. Uh, so we kind of inadvertently really more more friends before music but it, it's it kind of came at a similar time really listening to the same kind of things um i think i had a little bit of a um i had a bit of a fan worship of howard jones very very early on weirdly um i got quite into him I, i'll quite happily admit i used to have some posters him up on my wall uh, and got quite into him and then grew up grew up a little bit and started to uh, discover guitar music. I think a lot of the reason I 
am a big fan of guitar bands is because of my brother who's four years older than me and he mm -hmm. he used to listen to all of the synth bands and because he was my older brother I didn't want to like what he liked so because of that I chose to start listening to more guitar based bands and now looking back obviously as a, a near 50 year old I can totally get what he saw from these acts like your Depeche Mode, your Craftworks, you know, yeah. you know, he, well, he would go even deeper. He'd listen to stuff like Einstein and Neubau and, uh, you know, that's a band who would primarily just bash two, two poles of metal together and cut, create music, you know? So again, I picked him a parent because probably around about that time, there might be my brother listening to two bits of metal being bashed together. I might have, I might have had early Smiths playing really loud and my wow. sister would be listening to Madonna all in the same house. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm relatively lucky on that front as a parent. I got basically, I got two teenagers and a 12 year old and uh, the two teenagers share a room at the moment and they generally, generally kind of are quite happy to listen to the same music. But there was one occasion the other week where they were both sat in the same room playing different music and that was frying yeah. my head that was frying my head a little bit because it was like too very i can't even remember what it was but it was too it wasn't just two different types of music it was they were very um clashing and it was just yeah. it was almost like they weren't having a competition they were just both listening to it but it was almost like the older one wanted it to be a bit louder and the oh, yeah yeah i can certainly imagine that yeah and so, which yeah. takes the listening takes the listening pleasure away from it somewhat yeah. doesn't it when absolutely <laughs> Because, like, I can't. It's, it's. I get frustrated if I'm trying to listen to something and they've, you know, one of the kids or something is in the background, sort of playing. Anyway, I can't imagine getting much enjoyment if I was trying to listen to like one of my albums or something. And in the same room, my wife was trying to listen to something that yeah. she likes or something. That doesn't really work, that does it? No, but uh, you know, such as uh, teenagers. That's why headphones are quite a good idea. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, it didn't take long before I uh, I pointed that out. But uh, yeah, these teenagers, isn't it? They uh, they didn't want to give up ground, I guess. Yeah. What about um, like as a teen? Were you like interested in football, things like like sports and stuff, or was it mainly music? Yeah, uh, definitely interested in football. I remember hours and hours of just kicking a ball against a, a fence, you know, in the, in the summer holidays with friends and uh, jumpers for goalposts, all of that. Yeah, all of that happened. Um, I was actually quite into sport in general, really. I enjoyed playing tennis, badminton, things like that. Um, uh, yeah, quite fit and active, really, as a youngster. Uh, yeah, of course, but like, these are the days where you could just go out and spend all day outside and not yeah. be worried about what's going on around you and you know you'd only get told off if you were late for your tea but then you'd be straight back out again and as i say without the fear of anything going on around you you just you just crack on and then come home late at night you know and things are so different times are so different now aren't they oh yeah 100 percent. like we used to just go out often in the summer holidays i'd go out meet my friends play football all day and kind of, I would go on when my mum or my dad would come up to the park because it was getting dark and say, right, come on, you've got to go home for tea or you've got to get home and it's getting dark because like, yeah. I've completely lose track of time. But like, I think, so I use my 12 year old perhaps as the example. I couldn't think of anything worse of him going out at like nine o'clock in the morning and staying out all day and me not hearing from him. Or like not knowing where he is, not knowing what he's yeah. doing. Do you know what I mean? It's it's a very different world. But yeah, it's a hugely different world. world. Yeah. My youngest is eleven now, and there's no way on earth that would happen, you know. But no. it's funny. How, it's, it is funny how times change. Yeah, it's a different world, I suppose. But um, in terms of when you when you started, sort of actually going from just listening to music uh, to singing and and playing music and that sort of side of it what sort of age would you have been then well i guess probably around about 11 and 12 um me and paul decided that we wanted to form a band uh i remember i remember if if dates um add up he was hugely into simple minds uh, and I was much more of a fan of you too. So we, we already differed. Um, mm. uh, but I remember through the love of those bands that we thought, yeah, let's let's 
let's learn instruments. And I said immediately, well, I want to sing because that's what I'd always thought in my head. Uh, so Paul uh, got, managed to get a guitar from somewhere, probably a really crap acoustic guitar and taught himself how to play it. Uh, all admiration for him for that. And, mm. You know, I think just the love of wanting to do it just spurred us on. I mean, obviously at that age, we weren't really writing songs. I think we were actually, we were actually sat in each other's bedrooms designing record sleeves for these songs that we'd yet to write <laughs> probably whilst listening to loads of music and you know um then we we got this lad called lee muncaster in who was also in our year at school who could play a little bit of keyboards so and because he had a keyboard that was a big plus point we had this casio keyboard uh, and when i say he could play it i don't think he could play it that well but the first song we ever wrote was uh, it was called The Creature of Dreams. I think we were about 12. Um, and it was basically the demonstration button on the Casio keyboard. So it basically just played its own tune, which we claimed as our own and wrote some words and put it over the top of it. I think we've actually still got a copy of that somewhere. Wow. I'd love, that. Um, I'd love to hear so, that. So that corresponded with our first live performance, which was at Paul's in Paul's living room. I think Paul's older sister had a German exchange student staying uh, and there was a party of about 10 or 12 of these German students who were all in various houses around the area staying with English parents. Uh, so Paul's sister's German exchange student invited eight or nine of her German friends to come round to their living rooms while we put on a gig for them. And we played The Creature of Dreams in its entirety, which was about six minutes long. Amazing, and it wasn't just a, wasn't just your first gig; it was a worldwide audience. Exactly that, yeah, people exactly. People from Germany. Wow. Yeah, luckily they didn't whoop and holler at the end of it and ask for a encore because we didn't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like you were like you weren't bothered, or it did. So at least it sounds like you weren't um, sort of nervous about playing, singing in front of people. Was that ever an, an issue, particularly for you as a lead singer, like? Did you ever get nerves? Do you get nerves? Yeah. yeah, massively so, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I am certainly not, maybe not so much anymore, but certainly through school, I, I wouldn't really say boo to a goose. I'd keep myself to myself as much as possible. I knew what I liked and I knew the people that I liked and I was happy with that. So there was maybe a group of about seven or eight or nine of us who liked indie, indie music. Mm. Um, and we were kind of looked, looked down upon by the rest of the year group really because they were more into the broth and the, and the madonna whereas we liked the smiths and, and the soup dragons and things okay. like this so you know we had a different style of dress sense we, like, we had a different kind of style of how we wanted our hair so we were kind of the weirdos of the year if you, if you know what i mean but, but, I do, yeah. but i didn't kind of over egg that to get a reaction i just wanted to be left to myself to be able to get on with doing yeah. that without feeling uncomfortable being like that so yeah so you know even now before gigs i get nervous but i think the reason it's i get nervous is because i just care that i want it to be a good gig so i kind of build myself up into a little bit of a frenzy before i'm hoping that i don't walk out and trip over hoping that when i open my mouth and start trying to sing that a voice comes out it's all of the stupid little worries that you you know that you're hoping to fight against but as soon as as soon as the lights go down and the crowd roar and i go on and start singing then it's it's all good it's all good it's just that kind of half an hour build up before we go out there but yeah i still get that now but i think that's important i think that means i care about what i'm doing and and yeah and I, care and I want it to be good and i think to be honest with you, the reason we're still going and the reason why we still get to play big gigs is because of that i think we all care that we want to make sure what we do is put on a great show because people will come back you know yeah, but I mean, and this, this takes us nicely into sort of Shed 7, I guess. Like, was it 1990 that Shed 7 formed, I think, off the top of my head? Yes, um, it was. Yes, 1990. I mean, how did that sort of... Did that Was that just like a natural progression in terms of the formation of the band from the other stuff you had done beforehand? Or Yes, we basically... Were, we grew up in various incarnations through school, uh, usually... The core base would be me, Paul, and Tom. 
we had a school band when we were like 15 and 16 called Broccoli Haven that um, actually we played quite a lot of the pubs around York and we were, you know, we were 15, but we were putting posters up around school corridors advertising it, which obviously didn't go down very well with the teachers. Mm -hmm. But even that, we didn't really understand that. We just wanted, we're doing a gig. We weren't thinking, oh, let's go to a pub and get really drunk. We just wanted to go and do a gig, you know, and we were getting paid for these gigs, even, you know, 50 quid. It was a lot of money in them days, split between five of us. Uh, so, yeah, we did a lot of that. And at that point, we were, it was all very light-hearted. I mean, I've got demos of all of these things. And, you know, to say we were 14, 15, 16, it, it, it don't sound too bad. We, you know, we, we knew how to write a song structure. Obviously, I sound about 11 on all of it, um, which makes it more difficult to, to listen back to and reminisce. But, you know, we, we kind of had our fingers on the button even then, really. But learning, learning the craft. I mean, we sounded very house martins at that time because we, we quite got into them quite a lot. Damn, but then, that must be uh, awesome. Sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say that must be awesome for, like, your kids. Because you, you've got all that stuff still even if they don't appreciate it now, like when they're a bit older, that's going to be amazing for them to be able to look back and listen to the, the, your, like almost your musical life as you kind of developed into what Shared 7 obviously became. Sorry. To yeah. you, mate. Well, no, well, my oldest is 23 and then I've got a 21 and then I've got a, a 19. So yeah, they're all kind of au fait with it and, you know, they're more interested. It's nice the, the older that they get. Mm. It becomes, because they've known they've just grown up with the Shed 7 side of things. It's not an unusual thing to them. You know, when they were growing up, it wasn't weird for them to come and stand on the side of a festival stage and watch us. It was just life to them. But yeah, as you say, once they kind of start growing up, you know, I'm not one for pushing music on anybody. So I would never dream of saying to my children, look, you've got to like indie music. And I wouldn't go down that route at all. But, you know, they've, they've stumbled into it themselves and discovered bands so they've got the interest now so it's nice for them to, to kind of realize the heritage if you know what i mean but but yeah i think um uh it was around about 1989 when the stone roses released their first album that we kind of thought right we need to pull our socks up here we need to such a great debut album by the stone roses we're all huge fans of it and it was at that point where we thought, right, we need to, we need to start taking things more seriously because we, we want to be like that, you know, we want to have that success, uh, which we'd always wanted since eleven, you know. Yeah, yeah of uh, course. But we knew we had to up our game a bit to to have any chance. So that's at that point we kind of disbanded everything else we were doing and and became Shed Seven in nineteen ninety. Yeah. What well, um was there any difficult periods in those, particularly in those early years, obviously? When it became Shed Seven in nineteen ninety, uh, I think it was ninety three. You got signed for the first time, so you got like a three year period. Was there ever a, a part of that sort of early period where it was frustrating or difficult, or was it just about you? You know, just enjoying what it for what it was. Um, well, yeah, there's always frustrations. You know, I mean, I was working at Sainsbury's at the time when they used to wear them horrible brown uniforms with mm -hmm. the brown long coats. Uh, you know, and I would always turn up late, my hair would always be unkempt. So I don't know how I got away with it for so long, really, but, you know, I'd spend my day thinking of lyrical ideas and looking forward to the next gig that we'd got lined in and then gigs would get cancelled, this and that, you know, and, you know, things, all you're after is the end game, really, at that, at that point. Um, and yeah, there was frustrations. You know, we, we we did actually put quite a lot of hard work into it, though. I mean, we we, we started started to get a little bit of a buzz about us, which resulted in us going down and playing a few gigs in pubs in London and the uh, the Greater London area. And you'd think, oh God, we're going to London, but that involved an awful lot of work, as in hiring a van, driving five hours with the equipment on your lease, turning up at the the pub expecting to be treated like royalty because you've come all the way from York and nobody's bothered and then there's maybe four or five people in the audience that you'd play to and then pack it all up and drive all the way home again for five hours mm. but there was never once I think between any of us driving home after doing that three or four times that 
any of us thought, right, well, this is rubbish, I'm not doing this anymore. Which I think it just made us even more hungry. Which kind of makes me feel quite proud of the fact that we didn't just get do one gig, get spotted and then suddenly release an album. We put an awful lot of hard work over that space of time into it, which made when things started to happen a lot more satisfying because we'd worked for it. Absolutely. Do you remember the uh, like the emotions and how you felt when you sort of first found out that you were getting signed by a record label? Uh, yeah, total total excitement. Um, uh, we I remember we went down <clears throat> beginning of November in '93 to sign it, and we we went on the train, four of us, <clears throat> and then ended up at Polydor's offices. And we all sat down, and then our lawyer said there was a sticking point with one fact, one one part of the contract that he wasn't quite happy with. So we all had to just come home again without signing it. Which you know that two, I remember that two-hour train journey coming home, thinking, well, no, is was that it? You know, was mm. that as close? Was that how close we were going to get? Uh, but luckily, within a couple of weeks, had sorted that little point out. So we went back down and did it properly. Uh, which was just literally a couple of days after my 21st birthday, if I remember right. This that was a, a nice Quite. Uh, 21st birthday present. Quite the celebrations, I'm sure. But then there was no part. There was no time to sit and celebrate because it was full on after that. From the beginning of '94, it was just full on for probably seven or eight years, really. Yeah, I was uh, going to say you were everywhere that, at that point. Like, yeah. Um, you were just all over TV, radio. Everywhere and, and rightly so. I mean, like from people my age. So I'm forty this year, and um, like many people around my age, sort of Shed Seven, Oasis, The Roses, and that all that sort of the late eighties uh, and it threw into the nineties, the Britpop sort of eras. That that's the soundtrack to my sort of teens and and growing up and sort of in a lot of ways the the funnest part of my my life and sort of grown into an adult supposedly but um it's it was a special time and and i associate all your music oasis and some other you know, a few other bands like i that's what i instantly think of is kind of that era of my life yeah it was a really special time for i think for music and i uh, i have this conversation on an almost weekly basis um on one of the podcast I do with um, Scotland footballer Kevin McNaughton he um I I I think that the 90s was the best era for for sort of fashion and for music he disagrees where would you stand in that obviously you were part of that era where do you stand in it well I I, I have said a lot recently that I think that the Britpop movement possibly could be the last ever kind of big major musical mu movement really because of the nature of how everything's changed you know i don't i don't recall i don't ever think that we'll see a time where news readers are, are saying who's going to be number one out of these two bands at, on the news at 10 i just can't see it happening which is a shame but things move on don't they but i'm quite pleased that we were kind of caught up in that huge musical movement because it was it was a big thing i think it it's took massive but it, it took it dying out for people to realise what, what had just happened, I think. You know, I mean, we were caught up in it. We were, my dad always used to say to me, you've got to stop and smell the roses every now and again and, you know, just have a pause and see what you're doing and what you've done, what you've achieved. But it's impossible when you're caught up in it. It's like a juggernaut. You're just in it, you know. You know, if, if, you, have, if you have an album out and it does well and it's not right, brilliant, let's have a year off it's like well you've got to go over there and do this and you're going to go over there and do that and you've got to speak to them and you've got to record this and you're going to go and perform that you know so it was it was quite a full-on experience but again looking back i wouldn't have had it any other way absolutely i i, I would imagine so like just obviously i don't want to i like to keep these episodes to an hour and i don't want to take up too much of your time because i uh, appreciate you giving me your time in the first place but like just very quickly like what would you say are your sort of highlights of Shed 7 at their peak? Sort of in that initial uh, sort of seven to ten years? Um, well, I think all just the, all the obvious stuff, really. The firsts were always really exciting. The first radio play, I remember, I think we were in a car 
travelling to do something and, and we'd been warned that we might be played on this particular show and I can remember us all loving it, bombing down the motorway listening to one of our one of our singles being played on the radio. First top of the pops. You know, all of this all of these things become workmanlike after a while if you do it again and again, which isn't to say it's exciting and <clears throat> and we're not and we're lucky to, to have it, but it is your job. So if you're doing top of the pops for the ninth time, you know exactly what you're going to, you know exactly what you're doing, and it just becomes part of your daily routine of doing your work, you know. Mm. Uh, which of course is what happened. Apart from at top of the pops, it was always a little bit different for me because I think we performed on that ten times, and twice we performed live, fully live, uh, for whatever reason. But I think the other eight times there were mimed performances. Apart from the producer, always said to me that he wanted me to sing live because that was, you know. He, of my voice and the nature of the type of band we were so we might be performing after kylie who's just mined but i would always have to sing it live yeah so that was a bit more That's stressful cool. not not that i minded doing it like that because i think it's important to do it like that but it just annoyed me the rest of the band could go and sit in the bar all day because you're there from like 9 a.m and then you do the performance at about seven o'clock uh, and they'd sit and get absolutely hammered all day because they knew all they had to do was pretend to play their instruments yeah where, Whereas I had to be a bit more sensible and uh, and hold it back a little bit. <laughs> and I, to be honest, I always used to kind of slightly waver away from the the actual singing on the record, just to make sure everyone was aware that I was singing it live. Well, yeah, that was the common um, the kind of thing, wasn't it, at the time? And I was actually I, as soon as you said "Top of Pops," that was the question which popped into my mind. Is I'm sure I remembered Shared Seven singing on Top of the Pops because there was a few bands who did it. I think I, I remember Oasis doing at least one live performance on there. But on, on the whole, Top of the Pops, people used to mime, it, mime as you say. Um, mm. But yeah, I think if I was in your position, I probably would have just varied it slightly just so people yeah, know. Because... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the other... Um, sort of part I wanted to talk just, just about before we finish as well is um, Rick Witter and the Dukes um, which I, I got to admit I wasn't massively familiar with but I was reading a little bit about it earlier um, and obviously you released a, an LP which was de dedicated to the memory of your father and you've also, yeah. you, you know, you've mentioned your father a couple of times um, what's, you know, how big of an impact did he have on your career and your life as a whole? Uh, yeah, massive impact really. As I say before, you know, he was, uh, he, he just had music on all the time. He wanted to kind of do well out of being in a band and it didn't happen for him. So I think he was just really proud that it had happened. And I think he kind of almost lived a little bit of it through me, you know, in that respect. He was just, but it, even beyond that, you know, him and Paul's dad, certainly because we lived quite close to each other, we'd, we'd want to rehearse um, and they'd, they'd let us set up drum kits in the living room and my mum and my dad would sit in the kitchen and listen to this god-awful racket in the living room rather than at the end of his working day now get out I want to watch telly you know they'd always yeah. be really really pushing us uh, and they'd drive us to rehearsals and pick us up from rehearsals and you know he bought me a, a, a mini PA so that I could be heard over the guitar amps so you know he's I think he was massively instrumental in, in the success of me. So God rest his soul, but thank him. And uh, and Rick Witter and the Dukes, the, um, that was with the guitarist, uh, sorry, the Stuart Fletcher who used to be in the Seahorses. Yes. And uh, Rob Wilson as well. Like, tell yeah. us just a little quick bit about that. Uh, well, that was, the Shed's kind of called a hiatus um, in the end of 2003. Um, and I couldn't think of anything else to do other than try and keep singing. So these were all guys that I knew from York. We just thought, like, why don't we give it a go? Um, and wrote that album. Frustratingly, when we went out doing gigs, everyone was shouting for Shed Seven songs. And that's pretty obvious. You can tell yeah. what's going to happen. But it kind of usurped what we were trying to do. I didn't want it to sound like Shed 7. I wanted it to sound a lot more lo-fi and a lot more gritty, uh, which I think we achieved. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 
we sold a few copies of it and it was good fun doing it and the songs were good, you know, but then after about a three or four year break from Shed 7, we all wanted to, to have that proper big gig experience again. We'd missed playing live really as, as Shed 7 because that's what we'd grown up doing. So so I had to put that on the back burner. But, you know, there's, there's always t- a chance at a future date that we might reform and do a one-off gig. Why not? Why not indeed? Um, okay, so to finish us off, I um, wanted to just uh, ask you about, uh, you know, the past year has been difficult for everyone with lockdown and stuff like that. The last time me and you spoke, uh, which in the phone interview, which I mentioned, um, I think you were due to go and do some gigs almost the next sort of couple of days after that or in the weeks after that. Um, what was lockdown for you? Because obviously you guys had uh, quite a high... I saw straight away in early lockdown, you guys did quite a lot of sort of Facebook videos and stuff, um, just with playing bits of music and and just almost from the outside looking in, seemed as if you were just kind of trying to find ways to connect with, you know, your fans, with the people and just keep things going. Yeah, I think it it was just strange times for everyone. So you've just got to kind of do what you can do, really. You know, I mean, we didn't perhaps perform massively as a band together in lockdown through via screens. But, you know, we've always been quite actively involved on social media with our fans because I think, you know, without your fans, what's the point? You know, so we like to we like to get involved as much as possible. Um, We did release release that live album. Uh, at the end of 2020 and that was kind of our way of saying well you can't go and see gigs so this is the next best thing really you know mm. um, so we put a lot of time and, and effort into making that as, as top quality as we could make it and that seemed to go down well with people so you know so at the end of this year we can go out and recreate that live album absolutely so you've got um, a tour coming up um november through all the way through december i got to say, I noticed that there's no Cardiff on that list, which is uh, disappointing yeah, for me. <laughs> well, it, it, is, it is a strange old one, that really. I mean, we have to get this tour route in correct, and, and sometimes okay. sometimes towns and cities have to miss out. I mean, we love coming to Wales. We love playing in Cardiff. For the, in fact, the second to last gig we did was in Cardiff. Mm. Um, a couple of rescheduled shows from Shed December 2019. So we did play in Cardiff at the end of... February 2020, just before all of the COVID kicked off. And it was a brilliant night. I think it was a Valentine's night that we played there and the room awesome. was full of love. Um, so we will definitely be back because people in Belfast are disappointed, but it just didn't quite yeah. work out touring wise. But we'd love to go into Ireland, so we'll definitely go back there. Um, I remember the last 20, the last Shed Sun, we, we didn't do Sheffield because we'd chosen to do. Uh, Leeds Arena because we've never headlined an arena show so it, because of that we had to be careful what other Yorkshire cities we played in and Sheffield unfortunately on that time uh, had to be omitted and that caused a bit of a stink but you know we're, we're going back to Sheffield this year so you know swings and roundabouts the one, yeah. the, one, the one area of England that perhaps we should do more of is the Devon area because you know mm. we used to go to Exeter a lot way back in the day and and that was always great but we don't really seem to broach that side of the country anymore so we need to definitely go back down there at some point put that right do you know what i kept saying throughout throughout the show about our when we spoke on the phone uh, a year ago this is how uh, messed up my time clock is and how quickly or how the last year has messed with us it wasn't last year that we did that phone interview it was just before shed sember in 2019 Right, okay. So I've lost a year. There we go. <laughs> but uh, um, last question then, mate. Um, new bands that you're into? Oh, there's loads of them. Loads of them. I do a radio show on a Sunday evening. Um, uh, Jorvik Radio in York. It's like a, a local community radio station, but mm. you can you can listen to it online. And I'm always on the lookout for, for acts to play. I play I play demos of, of unsigned acts and stuff. But there is just so much good music out there right now. That, that, but a lot of it's a bit more underground. Um, I'm trying to think of the top of my head now. You put me on the spot. Hmm. Uh, well, from down your way, Trampoline, they're not so new anymore, but they're a great band. Yes. Uh, um, 
and the crooks are good. My son's band Serotones there up and coming, and I think they're going to do quite well for themselves. Uh, yeah, just loads of it. Yeah, you mentioned the crooks. Uh, I actually spoke to them today, and they're coming back on the channel in uh, July, I think. So I'm really looking forward to that because um, since I last had them on the show, they've uh, they've had quite the year, even with lockdown and everything. So that's going to be uh, exciting. Looking forward to catching up with them again. Uh, and of course, you had um, you interviewed Jack, uh, the lead singer, on your radio show as well. But yes. I, I will um, I will put links to your social media and I'll put links to your um, your radio show as well in the description below and of course the Shed 7 website and uh, the Shed 7 social Great. media pages Thanks. and that thank but, you very much mate oh thank you I've really enjoyed it and uh, it's, just, it's, it's one of those I tried to keep these to an hour but obviously you're kind of flying through everything but I, I think I said this to you before I could sit and talk to you for hours and hours but i uh, i understand you're a very busy man and i really appreciate uh, your time mate uh guys make sure you follow shed seven on the various social media platforms and uh, check out rick's show subscribe to ace podcast nation we'll be back next sunday with another episode of my story and uh, we also release uh, two live football shows monday friday and a mma and boxing show every wednesday uh, featuring some top names as guests every week uh, so if you want to ask them questions live you can join us on facebook youtube and periscope or twitter and it's always a lot of fun but uh, until then i bid you adieu thank you rick witter for your time and uh, we'll see you next week Cheers, Yeah, top of the world. Yeah, top of the world.